Hi everyone and welcome to the next episode of the Earth Science Review Series. This is going to be focusing on Unit 3 Astronomy with the life cycle of a star. So here we go. A little bit of background before we start the practice questions today. So the first thing we want to highlight today is the stages of the evolution of a star. So the idea is, in this picture, as you could see, all stars start out as a cloud of dust and gas, and this is called a nebula. So eventually the nebula gas contracts with by gravity, and the gravity makes all the dust come together and you get a protostar right here, which is like the early stage or the like the embryo of a star essentially. And eventually when it gets hot enough and there's enough pressure, this process called nuclear fusion starts to occur. And the moment that nuclear fusion starts, it produces heat and light, which is fusing the hydrogen atoms into helium in the center of the star, and the star starts to shine. So you need the fusion to start occurring before you get your main sequence star. Now all stars end up becoming main sequence stars. Depending on the size or mass of the star is going to depend on which life cycle they go down. So as you could see, we're going to start with the medium mass stars. So this could be medium to low mass stars. It's going to turn into a giant. Now the color of the giant depends on the temperature of the star, which we'll get to eventually, but the red are generally cooler temperatures than a blue star might be. This is going to be the path that our sun takes because our sun is a low, uh, an average sized star. So we turn into a red giant, our sun, and then it's going to shed the outer core. And eventually it's going to, we can even stick in a planetary nebula in here before the white dwarf. And the white dwarf is just the core of the dead red giant, and then it eventually burns out into a black dwarf. So this is going to be our path. Now on the other side, there's the high mass stars over here. So if the star is big enough on the main sequence, it will grow to become a supergiant, in which case the supergiant is so massive that it ends up exploding in a supernova. And the highest of the high mass stars, the biggest, become black holes, and the second biggest, or a little bit smaller, become neutron stars. So a black hole and a neutron star will never be the fate of our sun because our sun is just a medium mass star. And eventually at the end of the day we will get a new nebula that forms. So that's the evolution of the life cycle of a star. As for the HR diagram, so this is on page 15, These are this is the main diagram of all the star questions that you're gonna see. So I'm just gonna run through it real quick. There's multiple axes here and there's all stars in the middle. So let's start with the x-axis. We got surface temperature down here, which is measured in Kelvin. The hotter, as you could see, is over here, and the cooler is over here. Now the temperatures are also associated with the color on the bottom, so you could see red is a cooler temperature, and blue is gonna be your hotter temperature, and they, they are ranked in between. So orange is second hottest, then yellow, then white, then blue, white, then blue. On the left side, or the y-axis on this side, you got luminosity. So this is going to be how many times brighter the star is than our sun. So our sun is considered one luminosity, so a star that would be here would be ten times as bright as the sun. A star that would be up here, anywhere on this line across, would be about a thousand times as bright as the sun, and so on and so forth this would be 0 0.01 times as bright of a star as our sun. All luminosity is compared to the sun. And on the right y-axis, we got the smaller mass stars on the bottom and the larger mass stars on the top. So if you notice, the bigger the star is, also the higher the luminosity is because it's literally a bigger mass, so it will give off more light. The small stars down here don't really give off that much light. So now that we know about the axes, we're going to talk about what's happening in the middle here. So all the black dots are all stars. Now you can see most of the stars are on the main sequence. So about 75 to 90 percent are on the main sequence. So there's a group of stars here. 
These are the main sequence, which is most of the black dots. Then you got the giants, which are like here. I actually should have circled Polaris in there. And then the super giants up here. And then we got the white dwarfs down here. So you want to look at this as those groups, essentially. So the idea is you could see they sort of label the stages. So the main sequence is considered early stage. And then depending on the size of the star, which we just talked about, you're either going to turn into a giant, which is an intermediate or medium stage, or a supergiant, which is the other medium stage. And then after that, they actually don't show the supernova or the black, door, uh, the black holes or the neutron stars on here. The supergiant's life cycle on this chart ends here. But the giants will turn into a planetary nebula and end up going down here after it to a white dwarf. So essentially, if I get rid of these arrows, the life cycle of our sun will do this. Here's our sun, we're on the main sequence. It's going to eventually turn into a giant, and then the giant is going to eventually burn out and turn into a white dwarf. So that's what our sun would do on this chart. So they can ask a million questions about this chart. So essentially, um, they can compare all the stars, and you have to use the, the data on the chart to compare the stars, which we're going to see in a second. So that's generally the idea of this chart. All right, let's do some questions and see if you guys got it. So here we go, number one. The reaction below represents an energy producing process. So remember, it works best if you pause the video, try to answer the question, and then listen to my explanation. So here we go. Hydrogen, lighter, plus hydrogen, turns into helium plus energy. The reaction represents how energy is produced where? So this is H plus H gives you helium and heat or light. This is the reaction for nuclear fusion. Nuclear fusion. This happens in the center of the star. So A would be your answer for that one. Number two, which star is more massive than our sun but has lower surface temperature? So we want more massive but lower temperature and they give us four choices. So when you start to see the names of all these stars, this is immediately turned to page 15 in the reference table. So here we go. Our sun's right here. So we want a star that's more massive. So more massive. So it's got to be above it. So it's somewhere above it. So it's not Bernard Star, Proxima Centauri, Procyon B, or Eridani 40. So we can get rid of those automatically. This is gone. This is gone. And it has a lower surface temperature. So that means that our sun is about here. So it has to be, the answer has to be somewhere over here. Because it has to be more massive with lower temperature. So the answer is either going to be Pollux, Aldebaran, and Betelgeuse. So we can see Aldebaran is a good choice. Sirius is all the way, where is Sirius? Over here. So Sirius is actually hotter in temperature. So that's not going to be a good answer. So that's how you do it. That's like, this is like the cookie cutter question of how to use this chart. For other stars in our galaxy that go through a similar life cycle to our sun, which we talked about, what the sun is going to go through, which star is currently in the late stage? Well, check this out. Go to this chart. We know that our sun's going to go uh, turn into a red giant. My pen. Uh, red giant, and then a uh, white dwarf. But all we have to look for is the late stage. Check it out. It's labeled. So the answer is either Procyon B or 40 Eridani B. They're the only two labeled in the late stage. So Bernard Star is not in the late stage. That's on the main sequence. Polaris is a giant. So that's not in the late stage. That's in the intermediate stage. And Alpha Centauri is on the main sequence. So that's not the answer. So there we go. Nice and easy. Next question. To an observer on Earth, the sun appears brighter than the star Rigel because the sun is what? So Rigel is up here and the sun is down here. Rigel is clearly a hundred, over 100,000 times brighter than the sun, but our sun appears brighter to us 
literally because the sun is closer to us than Rigel. Rigel is very far away. So even though it's brighter, it's too far away to really see it well. So our sun is nice and close, so it looks brighter. That's why it's obvious when the sun rises and, and comes out. Next one. So there's a graph here, it talks about sunspots. Um, sunspots, if you see sunspots, they are cyclic and predictable. And they even give you a graph here to help you with that. If you see a graph that goes up and down and up and down, that's cyclic, meaning it happens over and over again and we know when it's gonna happen next. So the graph indicates that having the greatest number of sunspots occur, so we said it's in a cyclic pattern, you could see it goes up and down and up and down and up and down. So B and A are gone. And then all you had to do, the sunspot line is the bottom one, we had to figure out how much time is in between the peaks. So, because they wanted the greatest number. And if you, if you look at it, it's about, I can't really make perfectly straight lines down, but if you do that, it ends up being about 11 years in between each of the cycles here if you count the, the lines. So D is the best answer. Okay, another HR diagram question. Compared with our sun, right here, the star Betelgeuse is what? Well, the star beetle they're gonna ask for size, temperature, and luminosity. So it's more luminous, and it's bigger. So we could get, we could get rid of the smaller and smaller, and it's more luminous and bigger. So D has to be the right answer. I didn't even have to check this, but I will anyway. Is The sun is a little less than 6,000 and Betelgeuse is, wow, my line is so crooked, um, a little more than 3,000, so it's way cooler. According to the diagram, a star like Earth's sun will eventually do what? So here's Earth's type sun. All you have to do is look at the diagram. So it's eventually going to turn into a red giant, and a white dwarf, and then a black dwarf. So this had a nice supporting picture that you just had to follow the chart. It's not going to become a black hole. It's not going to become a neutron star. It's not going to explode into supernova. C is the best answer for there. Um, okay. So we got which star has the greatest po probability of producing a supernova explosion. So we got... We need it to be massive. So we said our sun is definitely not going to be a supernova explosion. So we're going to check the chart, which is right here. And it looks like our choices, if I can remember, are Procyon B, Betelgeuse, and Bernard Star. We want to make a supernova. We want a giant, a super giant. Giants do not go supernova. So Procyon B, Bernard Star, Betelgeuse. Procyon B, Bernard Star, Betelgeuse. Betelgeuse is, is the answer because it's a supergiant. Bernard Star is way too small, and Procyon B is also way too small. We want a massive star, so Betelgeuse is going to be your best answer. So that pretty much concludes and wraps up the life cycle of a star. Um, pretty much just focus on the HR diagram and the life cycle itself. And I hope that was helpful, and I will catch you in the next one. See you later.